thank you everybody for coming. So, um, well, you've heard that uh, there's uh, a little bit of switch, so there's supposed to be a talk on the, uh, let's say, history of Fastenome. Um And uh, I was actually planning to start from there, but uh, now we'll have to improvise a little bit. So, um, okay. So my name is Sasha, or Alexander Gagatinov uh, is, well, Alexander and Sasha is the same in Russian, so it's a short name, that's the first take-home message, I guess. Um, yeah. Okay, so, and um, uh, I will go with the uh, sort of tutorial or uh, explanations of the basics of SNOM, right? And this is the technology which is in the core uh, of NIASNOM, yeah? So uh, this is essentially what's inside uh, of uh, NIASNOM, yeah? So it, it's, um, SNOM is, uh, has three parts. You know, one part is the uh, light source. It could be uh, CW or single wavelength, tunable laser, and so on. It could be broadband radiation, typically used for spectroscopy, or it could be ultra broadband, which is a synchrotron, for instance. Yeah? Then uh, the second part is, um, we don't have the pointer, no? I guess I can do this way, no? Well, okay, so the second part is essentially the interferometer itself. So the point of interferometer is to split the beam and recombine it at the detector while controlling the delay uh, between the two beams. Thank you, yeah. excellent. Okay. Sorry. I don't need to control it, that's okay, just the, just the laser. I, I'm okay with this. No. <clears throat> Okay, and the third part is of course the AFM. Yeah? So what the light source does, it provides the illumination, you know, which is then uh, split up, reference arm, sample arm, and that's actually the unique feature of SNOM. So the AFM and the sample is located in one of the sample arms. That's an important uh, feature, uh, as we'll see later, so that allows actually the detection of the amplitude and phase signals uh, at once, not just uh, magnitude or intensity. Okay, now the basic principle. So what happens with this light? Why do we have the resolution? So, and the reason for that is because the light, which is focused by the parabolic mirror onto the tip, uh, essentially is captured by the tip and focused down to the tip apex, creating a hot spot. okay? This hot spot, because the tip is sharp, so the hot spot is very well localized, so to the scale of uh, 20, whatever, uh, nanometers. Well, it's essentially, it's uh, on the localization scale of the tip radius. Yeah? So this is actually the reason why NIASNOM is able to provide the nanoscale resolution. Okay? Now, what happens if you put the sample into that hot spot? Uh, the tip and the sample start interacting, electromagnetically, of course. Yeah? And uh, that modifies the backscattered, uh, uh, backscattered light from the tip. Okay, so the tip captures the light, interacts with the sample, and then scatters back, and this scattering is detected then at the detector. Of course, the scattering depends on, on what the sample is, what the properties of the sample are. And this is why the properties of the sample are encoded in the scatter signal. This is a basic principle. But, <clears throat> there's always a but, right? <clears throat> so, let's look at, this is an SEM picture of a tip, well, of a standard tip. So you see, it's quite a large structure, right? So it's not a small particle, it's not some a micrometer long object. Yeah? This is a beam, typical beam for uh, infrared SNOM, which is, has a waist uh, around 10 micrometers, at least. Yeah? So you see that besides the tip or its apex here, the small sharp needle, um, everything else also falls into this beam and it scatters back, right? And that of course creates a huge background. So um, we have to, uh, extract the signal from the very small apex down here from this huge background of everything which falls into the uh, illumination field, illumination beam. Yeah, how is it done? And uh, there is a trick which I think everybody uses nowadays. So it's a high harmonic demodulation scheme. So what is done is the tip is jittered up and down harmonically at a certain frequency, so on a scale of 100 kilohertz. Yeah? And then the detector signal is demodulated at higher harmonics of this, uh, of this frequency. The reason why this extracts the uh, near field, so this interaction of the tip and the sample, and uh, suppresses all the rest uh, <clears throat> is because uh, is because the background on a scale, when you jitter with a small type and amplitude, it's more or less constant. Whether you put the tip 20 nanometers above, below, doesn't really matter. So it's a huge 10 micrometer object and it just scatters, right? But the interaction between the tip and the sample depends strongly on the distance, okay? So it gets into the higher harmonics and that allows us to extract the signal, yeah? Would it be it? 
is it enough? So essentially sharp tip and uh, high harmonic demodulation give us a nanoscale resolution. Is it so? It turns out that not quite. Uh, and this is something which is important in the SNOM technology. So actually the detector measures not the field, yeah, but the intensity, right? Just general principle. So the detector always measures the intensity, right? So it's the sum of, as I told you, this background, there's near field, right? If you square it, that's essentially the intensity. Huh? So you will have three terms. This is the background term. It is suppressed by the demodulation, yeah? But there's one more term here, which is a product of the near field and the background, yeah? And this one, it's also modulated quite heavily because it has the near field part, right? So this term, I mean this background term, is called uh, multiplicative background. The reason for that is because it's a product of the near field and the background, right? And this background is actually, multiplicative background is often overlooked, okay? Maybe it's not important, let's see. So this is one of the examples uh, on a test sample, which is essentially uh, several, um, like it's a periodic array of uh, squares made of silicon dioxide, so this is the silicon dioxide square, this is the silicon substrate, well, actually, this is the substrate. These are, uh, as far as you know, so some thin layers of uh, silicon dioxide also. The point here is that you can clearly see this squares of silicon dioxide. Yeah, you can check the resolution if you do the line, scale, um, line scan across and so on. This is what you will get if you fully suppress the background and this is how the image should look like. Yeah? Now, if you don't suppress the multiplicative background, this is what you might see, okay? So this is not, this image doesn't show you the local properties of the material. It just shows you some interference artifacts, no? okay? Then the second example here, for instance, uh, this is a sample which has, uh, well, it's uh, two crystalline phases of the same material, material uh, silicon carbide. You see that there is only two parts. No? Uh, this is the proper image which you should see. Uh, on this sample, yeah, so you see the contrast, this one is brighter, this one is a little bit uh, darker, yeah, but now if you don't suppress the background or if you don't use the proper technology, then suddenly you might see something like this. How do you interpret this? So is it six different materials or different phases of the same material? Yeah, or is it, well, can you quantify, let's say, the signal here and here because it changes, so the upper part here versus the bottom part here is not the same contrast as here, for instance, or there. No? So in other words, multiplicative, suppression of the multiplicative background is very important. It can cause the uh, artifacts, major artifacts in the imaging. Uh, it can cause, um, well, essentially, misinterpretation or uh, inability to quantify the signal, in other words. Okay, how is it removed? So remember, I told you that there is an interferometer, right? And we will use, make use of it, the fact that there is an interferometer. So. With jitter, the reference mirror, harmonically also, yeah? And then we demodulate the detector signal at the sum frequency of the tip tapping plus uh, the jittering frequency of the mirror, okay? This is a so-called pseudo-heterodyne uh, technique and uh, this is what happens. So now we have to add the reference, of course, yeah? So we have all the a bunch of terms if we square it, yeah? so basic algebra, but only one term here will be modulated at the mirror jittering frequency and the tip jittering frequency, right? So only one, and this is this product of near field times the reference, yeah? In other words, there's no background anymore here, okay? And it has uh, additional benefits, yeah? So besides the full suppression of the multiplicative background, it also provides a so-called interferometric gain because the reference field could be strong, so it boosts our signal, yeah? So the sensitivity goes up, yeah. And uh, at the same time, you see, now you see that this is not the intensity of the field, but actually the magnitude, the field itself is here. Yeah. And we can measure amplitude and phase with respect to the reference, of course, yeah, of our near field signal. And this is very important, for instance, in the applications like uh, field mapping. So we have uh, gold structures, as far as I know here. Yeah, you can see the magnitude, but you can also measure the phase. And in many cases, phase is important. It characterizes the mode structure and uh, provides a lot of benefits. Yeah? Now, this is another application, important application. So uh, this uh, is the measurement or imaging of uh, small ferritin uh, particles. So they're only 12 nanometers 
in diameter, so they're super small. Yeah? Most of it is actually some uh, core which doesn't actually contribute to the signal, so it's just a shell, protein shell, which uh, contributes to the signal. So it's quite challenging to detect those particles, yeah? and this is where the interferometric boost uh, is, uh, be becomes handy. And at the same time, uh, as uh, actually, uh, yeah, uh, I'll tell you later why, but um, um, phase relates to the absorption of the material. And that allows us, in other words, detection of phase allows us to directly measure the absorption in the particle. Yeah? Here, it's actually a very interesting example because here in the AFM topography, you see three particles. Here, it's only two. Yeah? Only two of them are ferritin. And this is because we are able to collect the optical absorption. We can say, hey, these are ferritins and this is something else. Okay? Okay, so this is kind of a short summary of uh, some detection modes. Um, so these are uh, detection modes which uh, provide the multiplicative background suppression. Um, some of you might have heard of uh, uh, pseudoheterodyne. That's probably the golden standard of uh, SNOM nowadays. Uh, then there is also uh, two more methods, uh, high-speed holography, phase shifting. Yeah, so the good thing for us at least that uh, all three of them are patented and uh, there's uh, proprietary modes for NESPEC technology. Yeah, and uh, this is just a reminder what happens uh, if you don't suppress the multiplicative background and you don't use the proper detection modes. Okay, how much time do we have? No? I'll try to be quick and uh, go a little bit into the spectroscopy part. Yeah? So, uh, I will be talking about mid-infrared uh, frequencies, and the reason for that is because they contain resonances corresponding to molecular vibrations or lattice vibrations, and that allows, to, uh, allows people to do the spectroscopy, yeah, and spectroscopically identify materials. Yeah? So, of course, there are far-field techniques which allow to do it, FTIR, you probably have heard about it. Now, what we have also is a technology which is called nano-FTIR. This is a, pretty much a complete analog of uh, far-field FTIR. It, uh, once again, utilizes SNOM platform, so it's an interferometer, so we use broadband source. This is how we get the spectrum, because we have to have a bandwidth in the signal. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, at the end, once again, because we're detecting phase and amplitude, we can actually measure, at the same time, the reflectance and the absorption spectra, right? And they're nanoscale localized, because we have the tip and uh, suppression of the background and so on. So this is a comparison between far-field FTIR and nano, nano scale, nano FTIR. Yeah? So you see there's a very good correspondence between the peaks in terms of magnitude, in terms of uh, shape uh, between the two. Yeah? So here you would have to use two techniques to measure absorption and reflectivity. In SNOM or nano FTIR, you get these two measurements at once. Okay? This is how you can utilize spectroscopy, of course, by, for identification of materials. So this is a sample here. This is actually the face image overlaid with the topography. You see that there's something here. Uh, there's also something different here. But what? Hmm. Who knows? Mechanically, it's impossible to identify. But if you take the spectrum here and there on the particle, you immediately see that they're different. Yeah? And you can just go through the database and search and see, ah, OK, so these are the bonds. And this corresponds to the signature of PMMA, and this corresponds to the signature of PDMS. Okay, so this is nano-identification of materials at the, uh, with the resolution of 10 nanometers. This is another example, but I should probably skip it, otherwise we'll be really off schedule. Um, just maybe a quick couple words. So this is an antenna, a boron nitride antenna, actually. And you can utilize nano-FTIR to map the fields of this antenna, right? And uh, what you get if you, let's say, take a spectrum uh, at every point along, this, along the axis of the antenna, yeah, and plot it, so this is the frequency, this is the position, you will immediately capture the whole uh, mode structure of the antenna. So it completely characterizes uh, the fields of the antenna, which in many cases becomes important when you try to optimize you know, scattering or uh, emission or you use it for nonlinear properties for generation higher harmonics and so on. Okay, <clears throat> that brings me to the essentially conclusions. So I hope that uh, I convinced you that SNOM, well convinced, I sketched that SNOM um, is a universal platform which can be used both for material sciences and for uh, field mapping. Yeah? Uh, so, Andy will follow up with uh, more ap um, applications, uh, how you can use it, where, and so on. 
Then I also hope I convinced you that it's important uh, to uh, properly suppress the uh, background, okay? So if the background is not suppressed, you'll get the image, or you can get image and artifacts. And finally, there's a thing which is called nano-FTIR, and it can be utilized for material identification at the scale of 10 nanometers. So, thank you very much. That's, well, that brings us to the questions.